Gary Kasparov, seven points, Nigel Short, two. After three weeks of the Times World Chess Championship, the British challenger struggling to stay alive. Well, hello and welcome to London's Savoy Theatre, where Nigel Short has once again been on the end of some dazzling chess from the Russian world champion in a championship characterised by its brilliant open play. Two defeats for Nigel this week. The only bright spot, a daring attack in game eight, which forced a draw. Nigel Short has yet to win a single game. In today's programme, we'll be hearing from Daniel King on the Nidorf variation of the Sicilian defence, Michael Fox with more chess trivia, and a special interview with Terry Waite, who describes to us how important chess was to him during his time in captivity in Beirut. Well, with me to look back on the week's three games, Grandmaster Raymond Keane. Ray, undoubtedly not a good week for Nigel Short. Do you think the disappearance of his coach has uh, had some effect on this? Yes, of course it has. It's not just the fact that there's someone who's a great analyst, and Kavalek, his, his chief second, was a great analyst. It's also the fact that he was a friend and a colleague who'd been with him for three years, and the emotional impact must have been terrible for him. Mm. Well, without doubt, a disappointing week for Nigel Short. His chances of becoming Britain's first ever world chess champion now looking more remote than ever. Garry Kasparov showing just what makes him the strongest player the world has ever seen. Buoyed up by two promising draws in games five and six, Nigel Short had high hopes going into the third week, in spite of having to play black in two of the three games. Kasparov, however, had other plans and with the comfort of a three-point lead, went straight for the attack. Game seven was the champion's best game so far. I think the potential, you know, it's, it's, it's a very uh, strong uh, attacking possibility which is hiding in wide position and I, I was very comfortable. With the news of a rift in his camp and the return to the USA of his coach, Lubos Kavalek, Nigel surprised everybody with his great fighting comeback in game eight. He had the champion on the ropes, but just failed to deliver the knockout blow. A great draw. I, I think in general I, I played very well today. Uh, it was just I, I had an open goal and I just didn't manage to put the ball in the back of the net. So I think uh, to build up uh, uh, the, uh, this winning position, I think I played extremely well. Game nine dawned with everybody wondering what Nigel could do to halt Kasparov's domination with the white pieces. Kasparov, though, was seeking revenge for Nigel's impudence in game five when he'd caught the Russian out with some excellent homework. The game took the same course, but Kasparov on move 12 showed that he'd been doing some preparation of his own and had laid some deadly traps. In spite of a valiant rear guard action, Nigel failed to recover his position. Revenge was sweet indeed. My uh, counter novelty uh, was a smashing one, but you know it uh, it was quite unusual and it um, gave a um, hard time for Nigel during the game. But um, again, I believe you know uh, he had plenty of possibilities, and maybe we'll see this line again again in the match. Maybe we will. But Ray, last week Nigel Short had two very good draws. Everyone sort of had high expectations for him this week, didn't they? Well, the problem is in these matches that you alternate one week with two whites and one black, and then two blacks and one white. And this was Nigel's black week. Mm. Of course, with black in chess, you have to defend. And this week, he had two blacks against Kasparov. This is a mighty task. And his record with black is not good. Not good against... Well, his record with black in general is fine, but against Kasparov, the yes. super genius, his record with black is terrible. And having lost his, his chief second, Kavalek, the task became even more insuperable. All right, well, let's now join Game 7, which is played on Tuesday. Nigel Short playing with Black and about to move on move 34. Now, by this point, he was in terrible trouble, both with uh, his clock and also with his position on the board. So let's join it with Raymond Keane and Daniel King commentating. And Nigel's got to avoid the trap in this position of dropping his bishop back from d4 to the f6 square when Kasparov would annihilate him with a brilliant queen sacrifice. Queen h5 takes pawn on h6 check, which would just take him out completely. I'm sure Nigel won't play that, he would have seen that. Yeah, the problem is that Nigel cannot exchange off any of these attacking pieces. If he could just move his knight up and, and exchange some knights, but then the, the h-pawn over here is on prees. 
and only three minutes left now. Three minutes left. Short clock is running out. It's got seven moves to make in, in less than three minutes. Kasparov has how long? Eight, nine minutes? Yeah, short problems on the board are compounded by clock problems. The pressure from all angles is intense on the British challenger. White pieces operating, attacking on the light squares. The bishop, the Roy Lopez bishop on b3, the white queen on h5, all converging on a light square complex. The white knight on g4, also on light squares. And as Daniel said, Short just doesn't have a light square defence. His pieces are defending on a totally different line of attack. Nigel needs a good move, only needs it, needs it fast. Glancing at the clock. Oh, dear. Is he going to lose on time again? Oh. Is he going to... Look. The flag's rising. That red flag on the clock rising. Now, he's got to make 40 moves. We before can hear the clock ticking. Before 6 o'clock. If he doesn't make it, the flag will fall and he'll lose automatically on time, no matter what's going on in the position. But, of course, he's got to find the right defensive moves. He's under terrible pressure here. And Kasparov has nine minutes left. It's the hunter and the hunted in this position. Kasparov for hunter, hunting Black's king with relentless ferocity, trying to winkle it out from the last vestiges of its fortress. Problem is that Short doesn't have... He doesn't know what to do. He's glancing at the clock. A sure sign he doesn't know what to do. When you stop, and the clock ticking, pounding away, the seconds beating away, the lifeblood of Short's position ebbing. He's trying to block it out. He's trying to close out the noise. Yeah, that's right, because the players themselves hear this constant tick-tock, tick-tock, tick-tock of the clock. Pounds on their brains as they're trying to find the right move under this enormous pressure. And oh, Kasparov's last move, knight g4, the piece is He's flashing. down to his final minute! Oh, no! He's not going to survive. Nigel's had it. Now, come on, Nigel, make the moves! Seven moves to make. He's got a minute left. Moment of high drama. I think Short may go four down after this game. Kasparov is threatening to move his pawn up, that pawn on f5, move the pawn up and open the line of his bishop towards the king. He's running, he's down to his final minute. Now, come on, knight. He's going to lose on time again got to find a defence. Nigel Short is definitely going to lose on time. Kasparov looking the confident. There's his clock. You can see if he goes past six o'clock, he'll lose on time. Now, come on. He Seven to moves do. to make. He does not know what to do. He's completely stymied by this position. He can't make the moves he wanted to in this kind of clock pressure. Shaking his head. No. Yeah, he did, uh, just looking at the clock is no... And he's moved his king across. Oh. So he's only got six moves to make now, but Kasparov has a fantastic attacking position. And he's gone straight in. He he's given up the knight. the knight. He's given up the knight now. And Push it back. If Short had taken the knight, Queen G5 looked... But now Kasparov can just drop his knight back to G4. It means he's regained his pawn, and he's still got an attack that's equally ferocious. Nigel's gained nothing. The knight goes back to G4, and then the rook can come to h1 or even to e4. Short couldn't take the knight on the last move because of queen g5 check. Oh, wow. Oh, Kasparov crashing in. Kasparov Bishop takes f7. Element. And if rook takes queen g6 check, this is it. This is hopeless. This is gone. If He's resigned. And Short he's resigned. resigned. <laughs> he didn't lose on time. His position went. Now his flag's gone. What right. a massacre. What he a massacre. resigned. Kasparov's best game so far. And so the score after game seven, Kasparov five and a half, short one and a half, world champion with a lead of four points. It's quite normal uh, for me just to use uh, uh, the tactic that was very successful. I mean, I just playing the line when the Black's uh, um, uh, resources, active resources are very limited. And that's why Nigel is, is not, as I understand, very comfortable by just playing on the uh, uh, last ranks trying to regroup his pieces. And maybe we will see that uh, later on in the match, but for the time being, Raymond Keane, let's concentrate on Game 7. Now, that was undoubtedly the best game so far for the champion, wasn't it? Absolutely, and what he did was he exploited 
Schultz's lack of comprehension of this opening, which I think was caused by the departure of his chief second, Kowalik. He built up a wonderful attack, and then he smashed through brilliantly. It's a game for the anthologies. Now let's uh, take a look, which is what we're going to do now, at uh, what might have been. What are you going to choose for us from the game? Absolutely. Well, this is the position before Kasparov's 35th move. Which we've just seen. And as we saw, Kasparov sacrificed his knight like this. He came piling in. Now, Short didn't take that knight, but he could have done. He could have played knight takes h6. This is what could have happened. Exactly. And we mentioned briefly that queen g5 check would be the response. Now, let's see what could have happened if Short had accepted the sacrifice. The king must go here. The bishop drops back in the line of the king, threatening this deadly discovered check. There's only one defence. He must block, giving back a piece. Block that pawn. Exactly. The queen takes. Now material's level, and black has to try and stop the attack. And the best way is rook here, to challenge the rook. But now a wonderful move, which Kasparov had seen and calculated beforehand, and that is rook here, rook to e6, a fantastic move. Now the heavy pieces, the white heavy pieces, scythe across, threatening this knight. Short must take. And now the coup de grace, pawn takes pawn on e6. Suddenly, devastating discovered check from the bishop, and the pawn hitting the black queen. And that would have been queen. Absolutely, completely over. For black. Yes. Brilliantly calculated by Kasparov. So, in spite of the fact that Nigel Short was in time trouble um, when we got to, uh, to this position, I, I mean, his position was bad on the board anyway, wasn't it? Nigel was in complete panic. He had no time. There was nothing he could do. He was playing by hand rather than brain. But Kasparov's ice cold analytical brain had seen all this, calculated it, and much more. Now, we keep coming back to his coach, or his chief second, Nigel Short's coach, uh, Lubosz Kavalek, having gone back to the United States. Do we know why he did that? We don't. We don't know for sure. Many reasons have been given. Perhaps the working relationship with Short was no longer functioning properly. And yet he's supported him for three years, hasn't he? Had he? He's indeed. got him this far Absolutely. in the World Championship bid. He had indeed. Now, I mean, the interesting thing is that when it was known, when it was learned that Kavalek had gone back, many British grandmasters offered to help Nigel Short. Now, I think that you know, having them all pile into his hotel suite like a Marx Brothers film yeah. would be absolutely ridiculous. Too many cooks spoiling the broth, etc. But what could happen is that perhaps if they all volunteered their ideas, faxed them in, and Hubner and Spielman, Short's two excellent seconds, actually sifted through these and found the best ideas, that might work. This used to happen in Moscow, in the match between Kasparov and Karpov. Chess fans in their hundreds of thousands around the country would look for brilliant ideas for their particular era, either Kasparov or Karpov, send them in. And Kasparov, for example, employed a little man called Nikitin, Alexander Nikitin, who sit in an office, collecting all this stuff, sift through it, and every morning, on Kasparov's desk, a collation, a summary of the best ideas. And that's the sort of thing that Nigel Short, in my view, could well do with at this moment of crisis for him in the championship. The Grandmaster's there to help. Take the offer. Do you think he will? No, I think Nigel is actually happy with his team. It's interesting that many people feel he shouldn't be happy with just the two seconds. Remember, Kasparov has three seconds. He has Makarichev, Belyavsky, and the unpronounceable one... As my parish, As my really? parish, absolutely. Yes. It sounds like three people in one, but he's actually only one person. <laughs> and Nigel only has two. Hubner, the German, and our own John Spielman. But they're excellent people, both former world championship candidates themselves. And he's clearly happy with them. So if he's happy with them, perhaps we should let sleeping dogs lie. Maybe. Now, in Game 7, though, it was Kasparov who actually won the game with the attack. Nigel Short didn't lose the game by making a dodgy move. I had the feeling that Nigel didn't fully understand the position. And if Kavalik had been here, he might have discouraged him from that particular opening. Maybe, maybe not. But certainly, this was a brilliant game by Kasparov. A series of hammer blows, a wonderful attack, and as I've said before, a jewel of a game for future anthologies. Thank you for the time being, Ray. Now, of course, on a Sunday, we don't have a, a game in play. We haven't got the tension of that to contend with. So we do have a little time to have a look at some chess stories. So let's join Mike Fox with a little titbit. With me, as ever, is our own complete chess addict, Mike Fox. Now, Mike, let's talk about the history of chess mm -hmm. very briefly. How old is chess? The best estimates are that chess was invented in northwest India in about 570 AD. Some people think that the ancient Greeks had an influence on the game, but the hard news is that 570 AD is roughly when it was invented. I, that's the facts. I prefer the legend. <laughs> the legend is that it was invented by an Indian called Sissa, who was the advisor to a cruel and harsh tyrant. Um, and Sissa invented the game to demonstrate to the king that even a king needed the support of his subjects. And the king was delighted. And he said, 
What would you like as a reward, he said. Um, gold, silver, jewels, dancing girls, you name it. So Sissa said, I'd like some rice, please. Rice, said the king. Yes, said Sissa. Just one grain of rice on the first square of the chessboard, two on the next, four on the next, eight on the next, sixteen, and so doubling on. Doubling up. Doubling each up one. each time until we come to the end square. And the king said, well, that doesn't seem very much, but I'm sure that you've already calculated that this is an enormous amount of rice. It's this big. And that's enough rice to sow every country in the world 76 times. How the story ends isn't quite clear. Some say that Sissa had his head chopped off for being a smart aleck. I prefer to think that he, in the end, he did take the jewels and the gold and the silver and ended up his days in retirement teaching the dancing girls to play chess. <laughs> Even in chess, a story about dancing girls. Now, after the break, we'll uh, be looking at Game 8 with some analysis from Ray Keane and a special interview with Terry Waite. So see you in a couple of minutes. Welcome back. Now, Game 8 was played on Thursday with Nigel Short having the advantage of playing with the white pieces. We now join the game with Kasparov about to make his 40th move and Ray Keane and Daniel King commentating. Look at that. Kasparov using his finger to calculate the variations. That's very unusual. I think almost an indication that he <laughs> he's... Uh, this is typical. Look at Kasparov. Look at his face. This is the kind of thing that many no, grandmasters... I think this, this is an indication that, that he thinks the game is probably over. Maybe not. Maybe not. This is... He may have seen something there that he hadn't considered before. I mean, so he's clearing the decks for act further action to me. Maybe White can break... Maybe Short can run with his king after a series of checks, put the king on c3, b4, and run for the black hinterland, trying to hide behind black's forest of pieces on the left-hand side. You think that's a possibility? Let's, for example, the white king after checks, ending up on the c3 square, and then trying to run out via, via b4 and a5. Not to be sneezed at. Yeah, the problem is that once short's king, if short ever crosses this line, then... Black's rook will be able to come in and give check and join the attack. It may not be may not be uh, the end of the world. Maybe he can let the rook in so long as his king can nestle on the extreme A file. So you want to head for the hills over That's there? It. Yeah. March the king over there and hope that the king finds safety. Kasparov has played his move. Queen F3 check, and the champions made the 40th move. The time control's passed, and in a sense they can both relax. I think it's odds on a draw. A draw must be the most likely result, but Short will be examining this possibility of running with the king. I think if Short wants a draw, then he can simply move his king backwards one square, and I don't, just to this square, and I don't see any way that Kasparov can play for a win. So Short definitely has a draw if he wants it. If he's going to play for a win, he's somehow got to find a route up the board for his king to find safety. And it looks crazy, marching his king either over here or through here towards Kasparov's pieces to find a safe square. But it might be possible. It just might be possible. I think it's highly unlikely. I'm sure this is going to end in a draw, and probably fairly soon. I think this is a, a tremendous game and a, a draw with honour for both players. So, for instance, if... Short moved his king to this square. Then how do you play Ray? Play Ray. King to d4. Well, queen to f2 check looks possible. Okay, so, well, I don't see a way that the, the king can actually run. No, the king's caught in the crossfire. No, the I don't see a way out. I think it's going to end in a draw fairly, fairly soon. I think Short will have a very good look at it just to check that his king... No, I think he's going to continue. I think this is the greatest game of the match so far. I think, without a doubt, this has been the most exciting game. Absolute knife-edge stuff fought on a precipice. 
but analysis may well reveal that Short missed a win somewhere. But the game was so complicated, I don't think anyone can blame him for that in this particular game. No, I think, I think he's going to move his king back and be done with it. I don't think he's going to make a winning attempt. I don't. Think, it's not possible to win. Here it comes. King back to D2. Yeah. I think contenting himself with a draw here. After Kasparov moves his queen here down to F2, the position is repeated again. If they repeat the position three times, then it's a draw. And I can't see anything better for, for either side. Amazing game. If, if Short were just given a moment's breathing space, then he'd be able to launch a decisive attack against Kasparov's exposed king in the corner. But Kasparov just keeps checking, gives him no time at all, so the game will end in a draw. So we're predicting now Queen F2 check for black with an immediate draw. Which is played, and they've agreed to draw. Brilliant game, well done, both of them. And so, after Nigel Short failed to find a winning move, the score stood at 6 2, the champion maintaining his magnificent four point lead. One promise, just uh, uh, one hour promise, just we were sticking with it's just we, pr we promise fighting chess, and uh, yeah. I don't think that anybody was disappointed in all eight games. And this is quite unusual for the World Championship matches. Yes, I played quite. some of them already, and I studied others. And uh, normally, you know, it's a, you know, it's quite a heavyweight, uh, slow motion with many draws, and they just take just some uh, uh, preparations. But uh, in fact, in our match, we just were playing open, fighting, exciting chess, and I believe that the public is not disappointed. Well, I, I think in general I, I played very well today. Uh, it was just I, I had an open goal and I just didn't manage to put <laughs> the ball in the back of the net. So okay. I think uh, to build up uh, uh, the, uh, this winning position, I think I played extremely well. Ray Keane, could Nigel have got the ball in the back of the net? Could he have won that game? Well, probably not. I mean, the critical position occurred before Nigel's 33rd move. And here we've got the position, Nigel's white, and he actually played this knight in here check. But after the game, everyone was screaming, this move, Queen e7, is the right move to win. Is what he should have done. Exactly. But Kasparov has a brilliant defence, and that is rook here, bunching all the pieces around the king. Yes. Trailing his own goal net, to maintain <laughs> the metaphor. Check. King here. Check. He must take back. Bishop takes. Now, everyone was thinking that the queen must take the bishop. But Kasparov pointed out afterwards, no, he can play queen here, check. A brilliant defence. Must take, because the king and the queen are both yes. attacked. Must king take. takes. And in the end game, although Kasparov's two pawns down, the opposite coloured bishops, and the fact these pawns are doubled, means short cannot win. It's actually a dead draw. So Kasparov always had the draw in hand. Quite remarkable. And yet everyone was leaping around at the time thinking, oh yes, he can win this one, maybe he's going to win this one. Yes, I think it was an excess of patriotic fervour. I mean, <laughs> it, was, it, it was undoubtedly Nigel Short's best game, a brilliant game, and he came very close to winning, but there was never anything provable. Does he have that killer instinct, though? I think he's absolutely desperate to win a game. The trouble is he's playing the greatest genius Chess has ever seen, and it's rather difficult to beat him. OK, thanks, Ray. Now, uh, Game 8 began with what's known as the Nidorf variation of the Sicilian defence. And now let's have a look at the theory behind this opening with Daniel King. Kasparov's favourite defence in the match so far as black has been the Nidorf variation of the Sicilian defence. Black plays this sm small pawn move at the side of the board. This is named after Miguel Nidorf a Polish-Argentinian grandmaster who was one of the strongest players in the world in the 1950s. One of the ideas of this pawn move is to support the B pawn flying up the board to attack White's knight on C3, which defends White's centre pawn on E4. One of the other great advantages of Black's position is this strong central pawn formation, 
which is a tremendous long-term asset. That's the Nidorf. And that is the Nidorf. Maybe we'll see it again later in the match. Now, more from Daniel King. All I spoke to Terry. Welcome back. Now, game nine was played yesterday, Saturday, with Nigel Short with the black pieces once again. Let's pick up the game right at the very beginning with Ray and Dan commentating. Well, Short's black this afternoon, and he's really got to stop the rod. He must try and at least draw against Kasparov's first move, and we play pawn to d4, that renders the whole thing academic. How fascinating, how fascinating, how fascinating. Kasparov has won every game by playing the first move pawn to e4, and his only draw as white, the only draw he's conceded is pawn to d4, and he's repeated it. This is the, repeating the opening where Short's preparation was so brilliant in game five. Well, perhaps Kasparov has had time to just plug the holes in his home preparation and perhaps he's got something, some big new move against Nigel's brilliant opening. That Nimzo Indian. That the Nimzo Indian defence, which Nigel played the other day. Here it comes. Short repeating the moves from, I believe it was game five. Game five, yes. Yep. This is amazingly exciting. I mean, Kasparov's going to challenge him in the same variation. There we go. Looks like a Nimzo Indian. Yes, Nimzo Indian. If Short moves the bishop out to b4, then we've got this Nimzo in the game. Short just mulling things over. He He's knows. Bound to play Bishop B4. He knows if he repeats it, then he could be walking into some fantastic home preparation of Kasparov's. And there he goes. He's taken the challenge. So this Bishop move characterizes the Nimzo Indian defense, named now, well, after our friend Aaron Nimzovich, one of the greatest players in the 1920s. Now, this bishop move here, the bishop pins white's knight. White's knight cannot move because white's king will be in check from the bishop. So Kasparov moving the queen out, now that protects the knight so that if the bishop takes he can just capture the queen. And short staking his claim in the center with this pawn move, exactly the same as game five, that short's fantastic home preparation. Now, what has Kasparov got ready for him? He's taken again. It's, it's all the same, so we expect Short to take with the pawn. This was the game where Short drew the game in just 11 minutes of his own thinking time. So this is a re Kasparov's really accepting the challenge. And he looks, he, Kasparov really looks like he's, he's relishing the Bishop contest G5. ahead giving a knowing smile. It's all the same as game game five. Now, what's he got ready? Good grief. I wouldn't like to be short here. Yeah, this, this is a battle about Nigel Short's preparation, about whether enough midnight oil has been burned. Pawn to H6 hitting the bishop. Well, this might be... Uh an attempt to take advantage of Lubosh Kovalik's absence, but uh, I suspect that the real gurus behind this variation, Bishop to H4, are Ag probably Spielman and Hubner. Again, Kasparov going for the most critical continuation. He could have simply taken this knight and just solidified his central pawn position by moving this pawn up the board, just one square to here. But he's inviting Short to lunge forward. There he goes. Pawn exactly the same as in game five. But things began to change on move 11, didn't they, Ray? Yes, they did. Now, here you see the new move, knight g to e2, defending the knight on c3. That's Kasparov's first new move. And a glare there, the famous That's glare. Right. Short slightly surprised. Not knowing what to do on this one. And, and then, then we see Short's reply. His bishop's gone to f5. But now the move that Kasparov said was the really smashing one, Bishop to e5, hitting the black rook on h8. That was the move that caused Short such serious problems, and he short thought for 45 minutes over this. 45 minutes. Well, this left Nigel Short with problems from which he couldn't recover. We'll rejoin with Kasparov to make his 51st move. So Short's just played his 50th move. Short's played his 50th move. Rook check by Kasparov. Short's played his 50th move. He's attacking the white pawn on e4, but his own king is now in check. King moves. King moves away. This could be the climax of the game. Now, what 
what Kasparov, I think, is going to do here, he's going to play his rook up the board where it protects both pawns. Now that will enable, once the rook is on this square here, on the X here, protects both pawns and that will enable his king to run round and attack Short's rook. I think on this square, Kasparov will have no problems whatsoever to force the win. This is looking completely hopeless. That's a very clever idea from Kasparov. What Short should have done, in my view, is when the white king moved over, he should always keep his king opposite the white king so that there are no checks. The rook is now in an ideal position. Short can now resign. This is over. And Short has resigned. resigned. Yeah. So after Nigel Short resigned in game nine, the score now stands at seven points to two, a massive five point lead for the Russian champion. I can tell you that there are several possibilities for, for black. And again, it, uh, it took hours and hours and hours of work uh, for me and for my uh, uh, team. And again, uh, when I came to the stage today, I wasn't sure about the consequences of my decision because it's extremely complicated. And game nine was an extremely complicated game in all uh, variations, wasn't it, Ray? Well, but the amazing thing is that Kasparov got a winning position. He was two pawns ahead, but he relaxed. And this is the position before Short's 46th move. Mm -hmm. And Knight had really given up. And in fact, he played this move and lost very simply. But in fact, it was established after the game that here, amazingly, he suffered from chest blindness. He could have won. He was worried about moving this rook away from here because the pawn goes forward to become a queen. But he could have drawn by playing this. Not won the game, but drawn. But drawn. You see, he yes. can't win. There are no pawns left. The pawn pushes on. He gives check. Kasparov's king must move. King takes pawn. But he was worried about this pawn going on to become a queen. Mm -hmm. But there's time to get the rook back. And when the pawn goes on, he just blocks it. And then the black king can sail back here. And eventually, rook takes pawn. And it's just king and rook against king rook. A total draw. Nigel Short missed this. He could have made a draw. Think of the blow to Kasparov's morale. If Short had drawn this, two pawns adrift. But what, I mean, why did he do this? Is, I keep coming back to this killer instinct. Well, Short has killer instinct, of course, but he's facing the strongest player on the planet in the history of chess. And it seems to me that he's, he's like almost a paralysed, hypnotised, small rodent in the glare of some massive lamp. And when he gets his opportunities, he doesn't spot them. He turns his head away and they vanish. They evaporate like the morning mist. Oh, well, let's hope that changes next week. Meanwhile, we'll join Mike Fox again. With me is our complete chess addict, Mike Fox. Now, Mike, let's consider computers and their use in chess. Sure. Now, computers are very good because they can calculate lots of things very quickly. But give us some idea of the amount of information that a computer would have to calculate. Well, what makes things difficult for computers, and indeed makes them difficult for me, is the immensity of the uh, possibilities in chess. Um, if you were to take, for example, the number of possible games of chess of 40 moves or so, which is a reasonable limit, you'd come up with a number looking something like this. 25 times 10 to the power 115. Now, <laughs> when they put 10 to the power something, it's difficult to get a hand To visualise it. OK, yes. let me try and help you visualise it then. Let's take all the grains of sand on Blackpool Beach. Right. Add to that all the words ever spoken by everybody, including Ben Elton, since we started <laughs> speaking. Add on top of that all the words ever printed since the beginning of printing, including mm -hmm. the complete works of Geoffrey Archer. Yes. And then add on top of that every second that's ticked away since the universe began, that's 4,700 million years ago. Add all those together and you don't come close to that figure. Written out in long, this is what the figure looks like. A lot of noughts. A lot of, I think there's 115 noughts there if you count them. Should and be. <laughs> <laughs> somebody tells me that that figure it represents a, a, a quantity greater than the number of atomic particles in the whole of the known universe, which is why chess is such a difficult game, even for Gary Kasparov. And Nigel Short. And computers. <laughs> and Raymond Keane. Well, not so difficult. <laughs> oh, Raymond, <laughs> modesty forbid, surely. Now, uh, at the end of this week, unfortunately, the score is 7-2 for Kasparov. What about next week? Is it going to improve? Well, well, Nigel's got two whites in next week's three games, and I think there'll be an upturn in his fortunes. I mean, playing Kasparov is, of course, unbelievably difficult. 
I mean, I'd never actually played Kasparov, but I'm sure if I did, I'd play much worse than Nigel Short has against him. I'm sure you would, yes. right? <laughs> <laughs> but I think that with two whites next week, Nigel's really got a chance. I think that things can't get worse, really, can they? So I think they will get better. I predict next week will be Nigel's, Nigel's week. Let's get to a specific prediction then, right? I think three games next week? I think he might make one and a half points. One and a half points. So possibly three. game ten, possibly on Tuesday a win. Possibly. <laughs> Let's hope so, shall we? Do you think that he's going to uh, adjust this problem he's got with his seconds and his coach leaving? I think that he, he personally doesn't feel he has a problem. He's going to carry on as before. And I think he'll play the same kind of chess as before. Kasparov said it's very open fighting chess. He said it's very morning, exciting, isn't absolutely. it? Absolutely. He said to me this morning, Kasparov said this morning, that he will carry on playing in the same style and that Nigel will have his chances, but if he doesn't grab them, of course they'll evaporate and he'll carry on losing. But Kasparov is giving a chance. He's playing the most exciting chess I've ever seen. All right. Thank you very much, Ray. We'll see you on Tuesday. We'll be back uh, for Game 10 on Tuesday at 3.30, Tuesday afternoon, live on Channel 4, or 8 o'clock in the evening, or the late-night shows. See you then.